good morning, FC. It's good to see you guys. Um, thank you for being here. Thank you for tuning in online today. I want to talk to you about dream on, right? Like when that lady was walking off with Santa Claus um, and she said, dream on, sleigh boy. Um, the ability, <coughs> excuse me, the ability, the willingness, man, just the tenacity for you to keep dreaming on. And if I'm really honest, this is one of those messages that are just down in me deep, right? Like this is just, like this is a life message for me that I get to preach today. So my notes are a big suggestion today. Well, I don't even know if we'll get to it, but um, we will be, you're like, isn't it that way every week? So <laughs> um, when, when I met Casey, I was a junior in college. Casey, my wife, was a coming in her first year in college, but she came in as a sophomore um, and she was a year younger than me, and I went to a small private Christian college down in Waxahachie, Texas. And when, when a good-looking girl or a good-looking guy came to campus, um, you noticed him because there wasn't a lot of those that readily available, right? Like, like you, you just did, and I'm not being mean. I'm just telling the truth. I'm just calling it like it is, being real. Like, if a hot girl came on, you're like, who's that? I'm going to get to know her, right? Ring by spring. Like, there was just like... Like, and same thing with the guy. He seems normal, not crazy, not psycho. Um, let, let's maybe talk to him and see what, what happens here. And so I met Casey the first day she got to college. Um, and I have been there. This is my third year, her first year. Um, I introduced myself. I got to know Casey really quick and invited her into my group of friends. Um, and we started going out, and, and not like going out. We went out as a group of friends, but I let Casey know very early on my intentions, that I was interested, right? Like, hey, I'm definitely interested in dating you. I like you. I would like to get to know you better, um, whatever terminology you want to put out there. And 20-year-old um, Justin is very different than the Justin you see before you right now, right? So um, in Casey's words, and she would say this still to this day, 20-year-old Justin, this is a lot. And when she does this, she points to all of me. And I'm like, you're pointing to all of me. She's like, yes. It's a lot. It's extra, right? And so um, there was a lot of things. Um, I was just crazy. And so she was very gun shy. And so we, we had kind of gone on a day. And, and can we just determine something? I'm just going to set the record straight um, for something. Because Casey and I still fight about this. And when she speaks on a Sunday, she can decide if I told this wrong. Until then, you don't have a mic. I got all the power. So... Um, <laughs> We fight about this, but I'm going to tell you, if you're a couple today and you're not married and you guys are kind of dating, let me tell you if you've gone on a date or not yet, especially if you're in college, right? If, if it's college students, if a college student who is broke takes a girl out and he pays for your meal, it is a date, baby. I'm just letting you know, like, it don't matter if it was ramen noodles, it is a date. I was broke. I paid for her meal. She's like, that's not a date. I'm like, oh, it was in my head, right? Like, I was having a date with you. Um, but <laughs> she wanted nothing to do with me. Like, nothing. Nothing. Um, and, like, we were friends, but she's like, I just, no, no, you are scary. And I'm like, yes, I'm scary. That's true. That's right, Iceman. <laughs> um, but um, I just... I, I was a lot, and finally, um, I kept asking her and kept asking her. I just didn't know how to take no for an answer, and here's why, because I didn't want Casey to miss out on the greatest moment of her life, right? Like, the greatest thing that would happen to her. I'm like, this is all for your sake, babe, not mine. Um, so, but I was just one of those people that, that, like, I just wasn't going to take no for an answer in that situation until there was a restraining order, right? And so... Um, and here's what I would tell you, sometimes when you get the guts to, to ask, or you get a, the guts to step out, right, and do something that takes courage, or do something that takes faith, or, or to go out there, it doesn't go the way you dreamed. You get turned down, you get shut down. You, you take a step out there only to fall flat on your face, and what do you do with your dreams then? What do you do with your life then? Because here's what I can promise you. Here, here's what I know about every single one of us in this place. All of you have a dream of what you want your life to look like. Every single one of us. We have a dream of what we want our kids 
to be like, we have a dream of what we want our spouse. You're single and you still have a dream of what you want your spouse to look like, right? You're married and you still have a dream of what you want your spouse to be like, right? Like, we have, we have, I have a dream. You have a dream inside of your heart of what life is going to look like. So what do you do when the situations and the circumstance don't look like the reality of what you thought your dream was going to be? What do you do then? Because here's what I see all the time. The tendency is to give up. The tendency is to just say, well, it is what it is. And can I just tell you, that's not the reality. That's, that's not even a biblical way of thinking that it is what it is. And so today I want to talk to you about dream on. How to keep dreaming on when life just stinks. When life has hit you in the face and you have fallen flat down and you don't know what to do. And today, our, our, the person we're going to talk about is Moses. And we're not even going to get into a whole lot of once he's gone into Egypt. There's a little bit of that today. But today, I want to talk to you about the calling of Moses and some lies and some doubts Moses had to overcome to become and to accomplish the dreams that God had for his life and that Moses didn't even realize, but God birthed into Moses's life. And so today, our text is going to be found in Exodus chapter 3, verse 10 through 11, we're going to hit this scripture a couple of times, and it says this, God is talking to Moses, right? So here's what's going on. Moses tending his, his, his uh, uh, father-in-law's sheep, he doesn't have his own sheep, so he's taking care of his father-in-law's sheep, he's out in the wilderness, and all of a sudden this bush catches on fire, right? And, and Moses is like, wow, this bush is on fire, but it's not burning up. And so Moses goes over and he takes a look at this, this burning bush, and all of a sudden it's like the three amigos moment, right? Like the singing bush, will be coming around the mountain when she comes like that moment, that is what happens. <laughs> this is how I read the Bible. This is what happens. When God, when Moses comes and Mo, God calls out to Moses from a burning bush, Moses, and like you talk about a freak out moment, right? That is what's happening. Exodus chapter three, verse 10 through 11. And God's been talking to Moses for a while and he says this, now go for I am sending you to Pharaoh. And that has a lot of gravity, that statement, because Moses knows Pharaoh and Pharaoh knows, his, knows Moses. It says, you must lead my people, Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses protested to God, who am I, right? Like, like, do you know who you're talking to? Who am I to appear before Pharaoh? Like, I, I'm, you got the wrong person. And who am I to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt? Here's what's happening. Moses knows he's the most wanted fugitive in Egypt. He knows he's a murderer. He knows he has a stuttering problem. He knows his inabilities and what his, his capabilities are, and they don't mount up to what God is, the dream that God is telling him and the instructions and the commands that God's given Moses. like, man, I am not that person. That, that life is way too big for me. And a, a lie and a doubt comes in that comes into your life, into my life. And here's what it is. It says dreams that big don't belong to people like us. Dreams that big, something, God, something that big, man, man that, 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 that doesn't fit the job description for my life. Because all I'm trying to do is hide and survive life, not, not go do something great big like that. I, I, no, no, that, that's what dreams that big don't belong to a person like me. And some of you, that's how you feel. Because here's where you are. You're just trying to survive life, much less live it. Right? And when you're trying to survive life, can I tell you, it's exhausting. I mean, it's, exha it's exhausting to try to just, some of us, we're just trying to keep our head above water right now. And it's an exhausting way to exist. And yet some of you, that is your existence right now. I remember when Casey and I, we were youth pastors and we were broke. Man, I mean, we were broke. How broke were you, Justin? We were so broke, right? Like, like when we had Chloe, the hospital called and forgave our bill because they saw how much we made and they gave us a free year of medical care for Chloe and, Char and Casey. Like, I'm like, that's how broke. We were so broke. Like, we had to collect all the change just to go get 
get some hamburgers from like Sonic or McDonald's off the dollar menu, right? That, and I remember Casey and I talking and like talking about dreams and she goes, you know what, Justin, let's just stop, stop. We're just not gonna be those people that ever have our dreams. We're just gonna be those people that struggle the rest of our life and that dream's just not for us. And some of you, you're right there. I mean, I can, I can still feel the weight of that emotion. And it was over 13 years ago. I still remember the desperation and the joyless just tone of my, not at me, it wasn't an attack at me, it was just she was so upset with life. And some of you, that's where you are. And you say, dreams that big. <laughs> A life like that, that's just not for me. I've missed my moment, I, I'm too old, I've made too many mistakes. There's too much I've done, and I'm just, I'm just trying to survive. But hear me today, don't you believe that lie. Don't you let that doubt creep in, because here's the solution to that lie. Realize who you belong to and who God says you are today. Realize who you belong to and not what your past says you are, not what your current situation says you are, not your old running buddies say who you are, but realize who God says you are. In John chapter 1, verse 12, it says this, but to all who believed him and accepted him, he gave the right to become children of God. This is a huge statement because when you real, realize who you belong to and you understand who has authority over your life, you realize what you are capable of and how empowered you truly are. When you realize you aren't your own anymore, but you belong to some, you have a heavenly father that is the control and control and he is the shepherd of your life, right? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Then you, there's a total different aspect and, and, and area of life that you can walk in and you just don't walk in as a nobody. You walk in because he is your father. When we were early on to starting Foundation Church, and we were over at Memorial High School. Uh, every week we would set up and we would tear down and my kids would be there. And they would be running up and down the halls, right? Like um, Chloe was super tiny at the time. Charlie was four and she'd be running up and down the hall and fish one Sunday. Um, Charlie hardly remembers this, Fish hardly remembers this, but I remember it because it was like, oh, don't do that. Um, but Fish got onto Charlie, which I don't care. I'm like, hey, my kid's acting a fool, tell him, right? Like, I'm not, like, stop that, right? Some parents get mad. Well, maybe you need to start getting onto your kids so everybody else doesn't have to, right? I'm just being, <laughs> let's just call it the way it is. Like, just being honest, that's another series for another day um, that maybe we need to talk about. Um, but. So Fish is like, Charlie, stop that. And she looked at Charlie. I mean, Charlie looked at Fish and just her little sweet self goes, do you know who my dad is? <laughs> She's four, okay, not, not 14. She goes, my dad owns the church. <laughs> and she goes, and if he wants to, he can fire you. So Fish tells me this, and I'm like, oh, God. You know, I'm just like, I am so sorry, man. And so I go home, and I look at Charlie. I go, hey, Charlie, I heard you had a little conversation with Fish. She's like, yes, I did. And I was like, oh, yeah? I'm like, well, what would you say? She said, I just let him know you own the church, and you can fire him if you want to. I'm like, okay. I'm like, well, Charlie, you need to understand something. I go, I'm, I, I don't own the church. Well, you started it. I go, I know we started it, but I don't own it. Thank God. I don't own it, right? Um, I don't own the church and I'm not going to fire fish, but you could fire fish. I'm like, I, I, I guess I could, Charlie, but I'm not going to. And here's the mistake Charlie made. She overestimated who I was and what I would do, right? She, she overestimated who I was and what I would do. But we are guilty of the exact opposite with our Heavenly Father. We underestimate who He is and what He will do on our behalf, right? And we don't step into the authority and the promises that God has set before our life and in our life. And as a result, we're walking around like we are going to be those people when the fact is you are His people. And there is a total difference on the scale of it. You aren't those people. You are 
his people. So don't believe that we are just those people that are never going to achieve the dreams and the goals and the dream that God has put in my heart. No, 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 no. no. Understand you're his people and walk into the authority and the empowerment that God has for you today. The second lie and doubt we believe that Moses struggled with was this. I just don't see how it can happen. Right? I, I just don't see how it can happen. It just seems too big and too impossible. Back to our text, Exodus chapter 3. Now go, for I'm sending you to Pharaoh, and you must lead my people Israel out of Egypt. But Moses protested to God, who am I to appear before Pharaoh? Who am I to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt? There's two things here. Moses understands the, the significance of Pharaoh in Egypt. Egypt is a superpower of its day. It is the most civilized uh, culture of its day. Biggest army, big, I mean, you don't just walk into to Egypt and say, hey, let all your slave laborers go, right? Like, let millions of people that have helped build your country, let them go and we're never coming back. And you're gonna give us all your money and all your wealth and all your gold and all that stuff for walking out. And, and, and here's Moses. God's like, so I'm gonna send you with your brother Aaron that you just met, right? Like, this guy's a weird guy. Like I. I don't, I don't even know Aaron right now. Like Moses, Mo and Aaron don't know one another really all that well, right? They just got reacquainted. And I'm going to send you with a shepherd's staff. And through this and in this, you're going to see the impossible happen. So we've got delivering the Israelites out of Egypt. And then we got something else that Moses has never done too. Now he's got to lead a nation. Whew. It's different to get out of a bad situation. It's another to lead into a good one. There's a whole different level of challenges when you try to lead people someplace they've never been before. It's one way to lead yourself, but now I'm entrusting you to lead others. Man, you can't do that under your own power. You can't, you can't do that in your own strength. And here's what I would tell you. Here's the solution for you and I. Don't let your vision be limited to what's in front of you. It's only impossible until it isn't. Don't let your vision be limited to what's in front of you. Right? Some of us, we think, well, that is impossible. There's no way this is going to happen because I don't see a way. Can I tell you, your job and my job when it comes to following the dream and plan that God has for us isn't to know the how, it's the what. If you will answer what God is calling you to do, it's his job to take care of how it happens, right? Like when, when God calls Moses, he doesn't list all the plagues out that's going to happen. He's just, here's what I need you to do, and it's my job to make it happen, to take care of the how. But some of us, because we don't know how, we're not willing to do what because our vision is being impaired because all we're looking at and seeing and focused on is what we can see in front of us and we're saying it's impossible. But hear me, it's only impossible until it isn't. It's only impossible until you start taking steps of faith. It's only impossible until you start trusting a God who's bigger than you. I love what John Piper said. He said this, darkness comes and in the middle of it, the future looks blank. The temptation to quit is huge. Don't. You are in good company. You will argue with yourself that there is no way forward, but with God, nothing is impossible. He has more ropes and ladders and tunnels out of pits that you can conceive. Wait, pray without ceasing, and keep hoping. Right? I love that quote. And here's what I would tell you, when it comes to your dreams, if you can do it by your talent, by your ability, by your strength, and by your bank account, that's no dream. That's a goal, but that's no dream. And here's what I believe just inside my heart of hearts today. Some of you, you have an Egypt-sized dream in your life, but you're scared to tell anybody because it just seems crazy foolish to you. Right? It just seems impossible. Let, let, I can't, I can't do that. Like there's no way I can do that because of this. There's no way this can become a reality because this was my reality. And we start looking and we start limiting our vision and our dreams on what we can see right in front of us. But hear me today. Can I tell you, you are sitting among people who have seen the impossible become reality, like has seen the impossible not become impossible, right? Because now it is their reality. I think of Stephen Ragsdale, who's usually in second service. I don't know if he's here. Stephen, you here today? No, he's not here, is he? Oh, he is there. What? You were sitting over there, not there, right? 
Dude, Stephen, like probably seven years ago, oh, total mess. To total mess. It's because he didn't have Nicole in his life, but there's a lot of other reasons too. Um, didn't have Jesus in his life. I mean, he, his, he was in debt. Um, he got kicked out of school. He said he blew a higher uh, alcohol level than he had a grade point in college, right? Like, um, just like all this mess. He was in debt. He was living in an apartment above a garage, just literally trying to survive. Like what we were talking about, he's just trying to survive life, not live it, not live out the dream. And he's working and trying to hustle and do all this stuff. And him owning his own company and him being married and having two kids and like being one of the most generous people that come to Foundation Church, no, 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 that's never gonna happen. And yet seven years ago, that's the reality, right? It's only impossible until it isn't. And some of you, you're sitting here saying, man, I'm just too much in debt. I'm too much in my bank account. It's only impossible until it isn't. And realize impossible sitting right amongst your midst. I think of Nate Gormley right here on my right, right? Nate barely was out of prison five years ago. Like he's just trying not to get killed or have to work for the cops. And, and he gets out of like a halfway house for better, lack of better words and he's like I don't know what I'm gonna do like I gotta I'm trying not to get killed I gotta find a job he talks his brother-in-law into helping him start a company they go and start collecting leaves and then he's like what do I do with all these leaves I've collected right he did he's got nothing figured out he's just trying to stay clean and not go back to jail like just stay clean and not be an addict again he has no relationship with his daughter he has nothing going for him and yet now I look at Nate and he started his own company he's like on his second company he's got a relationship with his daughter his daughter called him dad for the first time a few weeks ago like that's amazing right and now Nate's hiring recovering addicts so they, they get, so that they can find out God's plan for them and start setting. Now Nate's going over to Teen Challenges and other people re recovering addicts and talking to them and saying, man, this is my life. And it was just five years ago. Hear me today. It's only impossible until it isn't. I think of Matt and Leslie right here that we did a wedding a few weeks ago that it shouldn't have been. They were told they couldn't even be together. And yet we married them together just a few weeks ago. And God is doing the impossible in their life because it's only impossible until it isn't. And hear me today, the seat you are literally sitting in, you should not be sitting in. This is a building of impossibility. The building that we're building, we should not be building, but it is a place of impossibility. And God wants you to understand it's only impossible until it isn't. Don't let your faith and don't let your vision be determined by what you see in front of you. But here's the question, what do you do when it doesn't go your way? Okay, Justin, I, I'm, I'm gonna step out, I'm going, I'm gonna step into my Egypt moment, and it feels like God doesn't keep his end of the bargain. Right, it feels like God lets you down. And I was faithful to do the what, but God didn't do his part of how it was gonna happen. And in Exodus chapter five, we pick up, Moses goes to Pharaoh, he tells Pharaoh, hey, let my people go. Pharaoh kind of gets a chuckle out of it. He's like, no, that's not gonna happen. And he says this, and Moses went back to the Lord and protested. Why have you brought all this trouble on your own people, Lord? And we'll talk about that in just a second. Why did you send me? Ever since I came to Pharaoh as your spokesman, as, you, as your guy, right? Like I'm your guy, right? He has been even more brutal to your people and you have done nothing to rescue them. Exodus chapter six. So in this time, God speaks to Moses. He goes, go back to the Israelites and go tell them this is what I'm commanding and this is what I'm gonna do. So, so Moses goes and we pick up there. So Moses told the people of the Israel what the Lord had said, but they refused to listen anymore. Let that sink in. The very people you're trying to help, the very people that should be for you are not even listening to you anymore. I shut you off, shut you down, that's a great dream, son, but that's not the dream for you. That's a great dream, girl, but that's not going to be the reality for you. They don't even listen anymore. They had become too discouraged 
by the brutality of their slavery. Some of you, you have become too discouraged by the brutality of your situation and you've stopped listening to what the Lord wants to do in you and through you. And then the Lord said to Moses, go back to Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and tell him to let the people of Israel leave his country. But Lord, Moses objected. I, 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 I get Moses. My own people won't listen to me anymore. How can I expect Pharaoh to listen? I'm such a clumsy speaker. Man, I don't even have the gifts to do what you are calling me to do. But the Lord spoke to Moses and Aaron and gave them orders. Do it, right? Like, do it, boy. Do it. For the Israelites and for Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, and the Lord commanded Moses and Aaron to lead the people of Israel out of Egypt. Here's what happened. Moses goes. Walks in with the staff, right? He walks in with there and he's like, hey, Pharaoh, you know me, I know you, let my people go, right? I feel like I'm trying to rap right now and I don't know why, because um, that is not my gifting whatsoever. So he's like, let my people go. And Pharaoh's like, no, in fact, I'm gonna take away their straw that we've been providing to help them make bricks. Now they gotta gather their own straw and we're gonna keep the quota the same, they're just gonna have to work harder. Moses goes, and the straw's taken away. The situation gets, Moses does what he's supposed to, God didn't tell him this was gonna happen. Like, hey, you're gonna go, and then they're gonna take the straw away. Like, if that would've happened, I'd be like, okay, cool, you planned all this out. Like, there's, a, there's five steps in front of me. I know that this was gonna be a setback. I planned for it. Here's straw, Israelites. No, that didn't happen. He's upset, he's mad, he's aggravated, because what he thought was gonna happen didn't. And he gets pushed back. And what do you do when your situation runs out of straw? Right? What do you do when you when, when all of a sudden the very people that should be for you and you're trying to help and should be in your corner are no longer talking to you, are shutting you down, are giving up on the dream that you have for yourself and for their life? What do you do when you run out of straw? Can I tell you, you keep staying obedient even when you've run out of straw. You keep staying obedient and going after where God is calling you even when it doesn't look like what you thought it was going to look like. Don't let your vision be limited to what you can see in front of you, but understand God is working behind the scenes. But hear me, if your dream's ever going to become a reality, you've got to stop listening to the naysayers, the haters, and the doubters, and listen to the one who has made made you, formed you, and knows you. Man, if your dream's ever going to become a reality, you've got to stop listening to the naysayers, the haters, and the doubters, because they are louder than anyone else most of the time. Amen. People are going to tell you what you are capable of and what you aren't capable of, but here's what the Word of God says. Luke chapter 1, verse 37, for no word from God will ever fail. Everybody say ever. ever. Say it again, ever. ever. No word of God will ever fail fail. Jeremiah 32, oh Lord God, it is you who have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and by your outstretched, outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. And God says this back, behold, I am the Lord, the God of all flesh. Is anything too hard for me? Is your situation really too hard for him? If he can deliver millions of people out of Egypt, is your situation truly that too hard for him? Luke 18, but he said, what is impossible with man is possible with God. It's only impossible until it isn't. Job 42, two, who has had punch after punch and setback after setback says, I know that you can do all things and no plan of yours can be ruined. Man, I may think it's a setback, but you've had it planned all along. Psalm 77, you are the God of miracles and wonders and you still demonstrate your awesome power. Can I tell you, God is who he said he was all along. Even if your situation's different, even if you've got haters and naysayers and doubters screaming and speaking in your ear, even if you're the hater, and you're the doubter and the naysayer. Can I tell you, nothing is too hard for God. You gotta listen to him. And what is he saying to you today? Because what I have found is we listen to the people that wanna limit us the most. When Chloe and I and our whole family, we went to Great Wolf Lodge and this is several years ago. I gotta close with this. We uh, <clears throat> went because Chloe was too small to do the big slides, so we waited a year, we went back. And we go to get her measured, and if this is the measuring height, Chloe's like right here. 
And this bitter old woman's like, well, she's too short. I'm like, are you freaking kidding me right now? Like, she's, she's half an inch, right? And she's like, well, I'm sorry. She might die on a slide. I'm like, I'll be the judge of that, right? Like, I'm like, no, you know, that's not going to happen. So, so she puts this wristband on Chloe's wrist that identifies that she can't ride the two big slides. And I mean, the death in her eyes. Like, the joy has gone out. Santa has been killed, right? Like, it's just like, I'm, I'm no longer have, have a childhood worth living. And I'm like, don't worry about it, just walk. And she's like, mm -hmm. I'm like, just walk, let's go. You know, I'm like, let's go. And so we get in, I'm like, Chloe, come here. Like after we got in for a while, I'm like, give me your wrist. And she gave it to me. And I'm like, rip that wristband off. And she's like, can you do that? I'm like, I can do whatever I want, right? Like, <laughs> if there's a spiritual gifting I have, it's for breaking the rules. I am really gifted at that moment. I'm like, we're going to do this. This is going to happen. And so we climb all the way up the 5,000 stairs to get up to the top um, slides. And they're like, does she, is she tall enough? I'm like, Chloe, step on my foot. And I put my foot here. And I'm like, look, she's fine. She's just right there. And they're like, oh, I guess she can go. And Chloe gets on. I'm like, don't say it. Don't ruin it. Don't let the cat out of the bag. That we, I got away with it, right? I'm like, just get on the slide, not normal, right? <laughs> I'm like, just do it. And we rode and we had a blast and we had, and she still, like we were talking about it coming this way. She's like, that was the most awesome moment. And can I tell you one reason it was so awesome is because we didn't allow somebody else's measurement of her determine the, the full experience that she got to have, right? Like, like we, we didn't let somebody else determine whether she was going to die or not. That's on me, right? Like <laughs> the full experience that she was going to have. And some of you, you have allowed imaginary wristbands and bands to be put on your life and you are allowing other people to determine the fullness that God has for you. And this morning and this moment is your rip off the band moment, right? That you say, you don't get to determine the dream that I have. You don't get to determine the dream that God has put in me, but I'm going to step out of my comfort zone and I'm gonna stop listening to people that don't matter anyways that aren't for me, that are nanny nanny boo booers, and I'm going to walk into the bigness and the greatness and the faithfulness of God because He's got great things for you today. So keep dreaming on. Keep dreaming on and understand it's only impossible until it isn't. I got to close. Let's pray. Lord, we love you. Man, I thank you for your goodness and your faithfulness even when things feel like they're not going our way. The Lord, you are not done with us. And Lord, I pray today that in this place, man, something would be birthed again. Lord, that there would be a dream birthed inside of our lives once again. The Lord literally, <laughs> we're literally sitting amongst the impossible. Lord, the people that are seeing the impossible be their reality. And Lord, your word says you don't play favorites. And that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. So every one of us have our limitations. And every one of us can have excuses and we can have doubts and we can buy in the lies. Or we can set our sights squarely on who you have called us to be. And where you have called us to go. And who you have said that you were all along. And Lord, I pray that in this place, no matter what our age may be, that there would be a new dream birthed inside of us. Lord, our dreams and your calling on our life doesn't have an expiration date once we turn 70 years old. But Lord, there's a dream inside of us. And Lord, we think it's, oh, well, that's just my time has passed. I don't have the money. I don't have the resources. But we have everything we need because you're our Heavenly Father. So let us realize who has formed us, who has called us, and who is directing our steps, and let us walk in the authority of who you said we were all along. And let us dream new dreams. And let us rip off and take off the things, the sin that, that Paul said that so easily entangles us, and let us run the race that you have set before us. All the doubt, all the failures, all the limitations, don't let us let it stick to our lives, but allow us and help us to run the race, to achieve the dreams, to live the life that you're calling us to live. And let us do such big things. They don't point to us, but points to something way bigger than us. It points to our Heavenly Father and that you would be made famous and glorified in our lives. It's in Jesus' name I pray with heads bowed and eyes closed. Today, if you're here and you say, Justin, I'm here. Your dream moment starts right now. 
I'm here and, and where I'm at in my relationship with Jesus isn't where I should be. Maybe you've never made a first time decision or maybe it's about getting things right in your relationship with Jesus today. Can I tell you, this is the biggest moment you'll ever have. And I'm gonna count to three and all I want you to do, if that's you, is raise your hand and we're gonna lead you in a prayer that will change your life. One, two, three. Is there anyone here today? You say, Justin, that's me today. Yeah. Is there anyone else? You join these hands that are lifted. You just say, Justin, that's me today. Because there's a change that needs to happen in my life. Yeah, I see your hand. Is there anyone else? You join these three individuals that have already raised their hand today. You say, Justin, that's me today. And there's a change that needs to happen. Man, let's step into it. Let's step into the dream and the plan that God has for us. And this is the beginning moment. This is that birthing moment for some of you. Is there anyone else before we go any further in service today? You join these three hands that are lifted before we go any further in service. If you raise your hand, if you please repeat this prayer after me and mean it from your heart. Jesus, I come before you today and I confess that I have sinned, that I've messed up and where I'm at isn't where I should be, but I ask for your forgiveness. I turn away from the life that I was living, I repent of it and I turn to you and I move towards and I grab hold of the life you have for me. I confess you, Jesus Christ, to be the Lord and Savior of my life. I'm gonna live for you the rest of my days. It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen.